Welcome again. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Richard Morrill, back to his home state. Dr. Morrill, who's president of the Teagle Foundation, is a native of Hingham, Massachusetts. He obtained his AB in history from Brown, Bachelor of Divinity in Religious Thought from Yale, and a PhD in Religion from Duke University. After a distinguished career as a faculty member and university administrator, he became president successively of Salem College, Center College, and then in 1988, University of Richmond. After retiring as president in 1998, he became the first holder of the Distinguished University Chair in Ethics and Democratic Values that was named in his honor. Dr. Morrill joined the board of the Teagle Foundation in 1989 and became its president in 2010. Over the last two decades, the Teagle Foundation has become the preeminent philanthropy contributing to the health and vitality of liberal education on America's campuses through its support of the study of liberal education, new approaches to instruction and engaged learning, and most notably, strategies for the assessment of liberal education outcomes. Dr. Morrill surely occupies a unique leadership position in American higher education. And he's ideally suited to serve as our speaker at this about the midpoint of our day of conversation about the intersection of religion and liberal education. He brings a perspective that has been shaped through his long association with the Teagle Foundation, his tenure as president of three liberal arts institutions, and his active engagement with organizations such as the AACNU, NICU, and SACS. But more than that, he brings his academic background in religion and religious thought, and a longstanding interest in the critical roles of ethics and values in student formation, and an expansive view of what constitutes liberal education and its critical importance for the health of our society. Allow me to quote a chapter from uh, something that Dr. Moll wrote some, some while back, reviewing a number of different perspectives on liberal education. He wrote, if contemporary little liberal education is to fulfill its aspirations to develop the full range of human powers and educate for democracy, for values and for leadership. It has to reconceptualize some of the foundations of its enterprise. It has to find ways to integrate the human powers of knowing and doing, of feeling and choosing as elements of human agency and of personal and social responsibility. This is the challenge that lies before all institutions that aim to offer a liberal education that will resonate through the lifetime of its beneficiaries. And it is one aspect of the challenge that we have grappled with here today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Morrill, whose address is titled Religion and a Larger Vision of Liberal Education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. Uh, please continue with uh, your lunches. I feel uh, very relaxed about uh, this session, so I would uh, solicit you not to feel uh, that there's any problem in um, a few forks hitting the plate. I can tell you very sincerely that it's a personal honor for me to be here because I grew up, as Henry suggested, 20 miles away from this campus. I also want you to know that I married into a family of eagles. Uh, it happens that my in-laws share the precise same family name as President Leahy. And my great, my grandfather-in-law, David D. Leahy, graduated from Boston College in 1896, went on to earn a law degree, and then served in the Massachusetts House and then in the Senate for four years. Unhappily, he met an untimely young death at 35 because of tuberculosis. But his son, David D. Leahy, followed his father here to BC and graduated in 1927. And then his son, my brother-in-law, John, came here in the late 1960s and played hockey and graduated with honors. Now, I also have to say that my sister Barbara earned a master's degree here, so that is a lot of maroon and gold. President Leahy, you also have a namesake in my family. 
My grandson, William Leahy Rye, resides in Concord, Massachusetts. That ought to be enough for him to be a member of the class of 2026. <laughs> so I'm at home. And in being at home, I do want to talk about religion and a larger vision for liberal education. I do this by thinking in the context of the current questions of the value of liberal education. And I hope to be able to shed some light by drawing upon religion as a field of study and what it has to bring to the questions of liberal education. The higher education press and the media at large will not let us forget the rising pressures on the future of higher education and the structural challenges economically, educationally, and technologically that we face. As a marketing consultant might say, we have a problem with our value proposition. With tuition soaring at public institutions and already at high rates at private ones, and with student and family debt burdens reaching dangerous levels, we find there is a single preoccupation in the press and in the public mind with the value of education in terms of its ability to turn out people with jobs. Federal and state governments are increasingly using quantitative indicators like completion rates and starting salaries as primary measures of the value of education and of public investments in it. The problem, of course, is that that data about starting salaries is often incomplete, anomalous, and often inaccurate. As a recent study that I just reviewed in my own state of Virginia revealed, we have to remember that those terms value and values have other fundamental meanings and we commonly use those terms to describe worth outside of the measuring sticks that we use in markets. This was called to me, called home to me a few months ago. I saw a magazine come into the house with a title on the cover, What Are You Worth? I opened it hoping that I would find some understanding of life's purpose and perhaps get a little bit of existential consolation. Instead, I find that there are some new metrics being proposed to how to value my investments. It's easy enough to know that those terms worth and what are you worth mean lots of different things. If it's a question of saying how much does it cost to raise a child, I get it. If suddenly some were to say what then is the unconditional value of your child, I think we're into different kinds of worth. Now the same premise holds true when we start to think about the value of a liberal education. Equating monetary value and educational value obviously is a large mistake, but it's taking hold now in the public mind as if those two forms of value were identical. I think we can help sort out some of the terms. Some years ago, Professor Thomas Green put it this way, we are born into the world, but we are educated into the possession of our human powers for intellect, imagination, description, analysis, language, and action in a coherent way. Taking hold of these powers that we have as human beings is the center, if you will, of the good, it is the way in which we define the presence of educational worth. So in this telling, education occurs across the lifespan and in many different contexts, and to be sure, in schools, 
colleges and universities. The formal elements of the educational process crystallize knowledge into disciplines that carry their own intrinsic worth, but that also become instrumental to the educational unfolding of human possibility as a claim of human dignity. An education in the arts and sciences plays a powerful part in the shaping of human capabilities. Recent efforts to evaluate student learning have in fact come to center on what are typically called learning outcomes. Now that language can be mechanistic and it can often be misleading, but nonetheless, it often focuses us on the idea of powers of mind and deepened human sensibilities and civic capacities that are the consequences of the intense study of important problems, methods, texts, and artifacts. So the, the key to seeing the enduring power of liberal education is to trace the ways in which it takes up residence in the lives of our students as they go on to become independent thinkers and agents of their own lives. We now commonly refer to the powers of education and the essential, quote, learning outcomes in familiar ways. We talk about the ways the studies in our disciplines produce various forms and powers of critical thinking, of integrative thinking, of quantitative reasoning, of effective communication, of problem solving, and of personal and social responsibility. While not instantly quantifiable at graduation, there was no question of the educational and human values of these capabilities as our students take up their place as citizens, in the workforce, and as human beings. So those educational values, valuable in themselves, translate instru into instrumental values that have deep practicality in the contexts that I've just suggested. We could take any of those capabilities that I've outlined and see them as an entry point into the more specific ways that the arts and sciences open cognitive and personal doors into the intellectual, social, natural, and spiritual worlds of meaning in which we live. Let me engage my own thoughts on liberal education by examining how the study of religion contributes to it. I will do so primarily by thinking about religion descriptively as one of the fields in the humanities, alongside subjects such as literature and philosophy and classics and history on many of its sides and the fine arts. These fields, of course, study human creativity and self-expression. They seek to make sense of the complexities of our lived experience. They explore, to be sure, the wider issues of the questions of meaning and purpose within the human condition. The humanities typically and often do this from the point of view of lived experience and the ways in which our own imaginative and lived narratives shape and form our personal identities. We often look to those narratives to find what values and master images of fulfillment have been embedded in them. We do this in colleges and universities when we talk of mission and vision. We do this personally when we begin to share and think through what is it that brings us enduring satisfactions and constitutes our identities. Now we come to the study of the humanities and of religion in a perplexing time because we know that the interest in focusing on these fields of studies in college, certainly as majors and now increasingly in graduate school, is in decline. 
The problem is explained by critics from many points of view. They suggest that we have an incoherent and fractured curriculum, an academic culture, as we've said in many contexts in this symposium, that lodges professional identity in uh, research and in specialized inquiry rather than undergraduate teaching. And of course, in the sharp and understandable interest that students and parents now have in finding a field of study that leads directly to a job. So all these influences and others have moved the energy and attention away from dealing with the great questions of meaning and value even in fields like philosophy and religion. When I look at some contemporary offerings in my field of religion, I look and wonder and say, is this really what is at the center of the subject now? Because often there is a loss of focus uh, on the larger questions of meaning and value. In fact, on most campuses, as we, I think, have heard today, Many questions of religion have, and value have moved into the, into the private sphere. They seem, for most of our faculty, to be outside the realms of argumentation and evidence that prevail in most disciplines. Academic skepticism about broad value questions abounds because we have often seen the disciplines evolve toward finding the places where some pattern of bias or domination has worked its way into the analytical findings. That is to say, when we look at issues of race, class, and gender, as is proper and, and useful and essential to do, professors then, in, so, in some disciplines, often believe the question has then been exhausted, and the, the larger environing questions often are not then the focus of attention. So it becomes harder to integrate the big questions into the curriculum and into the lived missions of the campus. Now these claims about liberal education and its challenges have been with us for a very long time, and the tensions about how to study the humanities have been the subject of the famous disputes and wars around the curriculum going back 30 and 40 years. And there's been a large stream of studies uh, on all sides of these questions from the late 1970s on. But I suggest more recently, in the past five, six, seven years, there has been a new turn in some of the literature tracing the importance of the humanities and what we might call the great questions, we now find a more sympathetic openness to think through how we might focus more effectively on a more coherent approach to these questions that engage students at critical levels. A few years back, I think it was in 2000, Five, Derek Bach, president of Harvard, twice president of Harvard, put out a book that many of you will have seen uh, called Our Underachieving Colleges. And it was a balanced effort to show, in effect, the places where higher education seems to do a mediocre job in addressing student learning and places where it stands in significant need of improvement. Also interesting to me is that in the last five years, other writers, often from very visible and prestigious universities, who have held very important leadership roles in those institutions, are coming forth with their own books that have some parallels and some common themes. So just to illustrate with a few, Anthony Cronman, former dean of the Yale Law School, came out with a book several years ago called Education's End, Why Our Colleges and Universities Have Given Up on the Question of the Meaning of Life. Not to be outdone in their sometimes rivalry, uh, the former dean 
of Harvard College, Harry Lewis, came out with a book called Excellence Without a Soul, How a Great University Forgot Education. You notice the dra dramatic level of the titles. You can learn a lot from listening to those titles. And the books, in fact, are about what they say. About four years ago, Martha Nussbaum at the University of Chicago, a very prolific writer with uh, many creative insights, put out a little book called Not for Profit, Why Democracy Needs the Humanities. And in doing so, offered an analysis of the forms of critical thinking in the humanities that in fact are essential uh, in a liberal education, focusing on how the humanities can develop certain dimensions of critical thinking, forms of empathy, as well as uh, a, a moral imagination. Mark Roche, former dean at Notre Dame, came out with a, an award-winning book called Why Choose the Liberal Arts? And Andy Del Banco, our panelist this morning, a year ago, came out with his lovely book, College What It Was, Is, and Should Be. Now, Andy is a friend and a colleague, so I had the chance to read his book both in preparation and after completion, and he tells a beautifully crafted story. Like many of the other authors on this list, Del Banco suggests that the years in college are a time when students are trying to find themselves and to shape their identities. In developing that story, he found in his research a manuscript from, the, from 1850 by a student at a little college in southwestern Virginia, Emory and Henry College. And that student wrote down in his diary, coming back from a sermon by the college president, oh, that the Lord would show me how to think and how to choose. How to think and how to choose. Del Banco goes on to suggest that the religious authority of colleges, for the most part, is long gone but he has never found a better way than that phrase to capture what liberal education should do. He says, a college should be, quote, an aid, an aid to reflection, a place and process whereby young people take stock of their talents and passions and begin to sort out their lives in a way that is true to themselves and responsible to others. Both he and other authors suggest that their, ideas, that their ideas and methods of dialogue, vocabularies and forms of reflection that are, me are mediated by great texts and that can help students put probing and substantive questions to themselves as a critical dimension of college education. What I take to be especially interesting in these sets of books is the claim that the core of college education has to do with the formation of the self's identity in the inescapable quest for human fullness. Not just, although it's essential, the mastery of knowledge or the preparation for a job. Also interesting is that except, except for Mark Roach at Notre Dame with its religious tradition, the authors of these books do not place the study or the practice of religion in a central place in their narratives. Del Banco does provide a very sensitive and probing analysis of the Puritan tradition, and he appropriates its deep moral seriousness about the larger questions of education, but notes, again, the privatization of religion and its loss of authority on most campuses. Bach, uh, Derek Bach focuses strongly on the importance of moral education, but does not discuss religion. Kronman largely relegates religion to fundamentalism and has some hope in, for secular humanism. Nussbaum offers very powerful arguments for the connection between education and human dignity but does not then go on to define 
how that has any transcendent source, although it does appear to be built into the very nature of things. In many ways, these authors then are providing, and again, I think Roche is a partial exception on this, an affirmation of education as a way in which to develop an authenticity of personal choice that would include the content of a strong democratic conscience. After careful and deep reflection over important texts, students have to be the final arbiters of their choices, of what makes sense for them in their lives. Now, to be sure, as the authors suggest that it's important that you be true to yourself and that you care about others, there is a whole set of tacit values and criteria that come with those claims. They are embedded in much of the cultural beliefs that we have inherited in our society. And those humanistic and democratic values make a claim in our ordinary experience. And they are invoked successfully, I think, by these authors. When you hear them, it's hard not to say the point comes home. But from the point of view of religious studies, simply as a descriptive task, you step back and wonder from the approaches that one finds in religion, whether the criteria for the ultimate foundation and the source of the motivation to reach those standards for fullness have been fully described. So should I define my quest for life around justice and love? Or from the point of view of authenticity, is it perfectly adequate if I say that power and wealth suffice? Are my authentic choices necessarily my best choices? And how do I know? And as times shift and change and as we live through thick and thin, what is it or how is it that I sustain my commitment to whatever values I've chosen? Now, like all humanities disciplines, the study of religion is an academic field. It engages scholarly methods from the study of ancient languages, cultures, and texts to history, sociology, philosophy, and theology. The canons of objective analysis, critical thinking, the use of evidence and argumentation apply in religion as in every other academic discipline. In fact, like many other disciplines in the humanities, the study of religion on many campuses has differentiated itself from any specific concern with the questions of meaning. Most professors make a sharp distinction between whatever religion they may or may not practice and study and whether that has special relevance uh, to the great questions. I'd like to take a little different turn on that question and suggest that just as humanities fields develop powerful learning outcomes, the study of religion does the same. And in ways that can have a strong bearing on understanding and addressing the issues of identity and values. The study of religious texts and the full range of religious expressions, from doctrines to disciplines, fosters patterns of thinking and learning with its own distinctiveness. The broad critical abilities shaped by religious study have potential application in shaping a set of tools and questions which can be appropriated both to understand and, in fact, to influence our choices about the persons we are and hope to become. In essence, just as we aim in universities to teach people how to think, we can legitimately aspire to teach students how to value 
and to encourage and enable them to develop an internalized critical apparatus for making choices among values and forms of life. So let's start with Del Banco's 1850 refrain, how to think and how to choose. If we do that, we can begin to see the range, the depth, and the intensity that religious inquiry brings to study in the humanities as it presses toward ever-enlarging spatial, temporal, and cultural horizons. In religious study, we begin to see what happens to what we might call the ordinary criteria that we carry with us naturally as we work ourselves through the choices in our lives. We continuously, as we search for fullness and integrity, carry natural questions about the adequacy of our choices to, to, cure, to secure stable meanings in our beliefs and to find faithfulness in our relationships. It comes with experience. We wonder how to choose in ways that are consistent with our values and to avoid actions and contradictions both within ourselves and conflicts with others. We try to attain comprehensiveness by embracing ever wider circles of experience and reality and to affirm patterns of life that are different than our own. We silently or consciously aim to achieve durability in our commitments that meet challenges over time and that, and that endure for all the seasons of our life and beyond. In this process of interrogating forms of life, religion seems to press inescapably for transcendent forms of reflection, to push behind policies and to ask what are the principles of ethics in which they're based. Then to push the ethics and to say, how is that system of right good for humankind, not just our kind? And how then do we find the human project to be part of all creation so that we see ourselves in partnership in a peaceable kingdom in a universal commonwealth of being, to use a phrase from Richard Niebuhr. Now, rather than going on with this kind of abstract analysis of criteria, let me just turn to one or two texts to see religious reflection at work in the ways in which I've suggested. There is a distinctly religious form of argumentation we go to Isaiah chapter 44, we find a lengthy critique of making and worshiping idols. And it shows religious reflection at work. The carpenter cuts down a tree and uses part of it to build a fire that cooks his food and warms his home. And with the rest, he carves something in human form as an idol for his house. The text says, quote, no one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, half of it I burned in the fire. Shall I now fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deluded mind has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie, the idol, in my right hand? The language of those texts is of several types. Some of it is about faithfulness to an object of, of love, but some of it is about, much of it, discernment, knowledge, and reflection. 
So the biblical writer in this context and in other passages in this section suggests that the people of Israel are up against a sweeping creative power that has set the stars in the heavens. And that Lord of life has to be understood, or any Lord, by criteria of comprehensiveness, of eternity, of oneness, and love that are adequate to the reality of experience. So deity has criteria. So what religion as a field of inquiry provides is an opportunity to develop a fuller science of mattering, providing patterns of awareness of the adequacy and capability of what humans care most about as those humans come to terms with the ultimate circumstances of the human condition. Now, if we look at other passages in Isaiah, we find those sections that describe the suffering servant. And as we turn to passages from the Gospels, we find that same approach to understand human fullness. The texts in those contexts reveal that humans find the good that they seek, but not in ways that they expected. Humans want something that they can love, and all humanity's texts throughout the ages would suggest that. But these texts suggest that instead they find a self-emptying love that first loved them. In Genesis, Abraham is the father of faith who is willing in fear and trembling to offer up his beloved son, but he receives his son back as a gift. So other passages in the Gospels suggest that same question of how is it one can live in the world, but not of the world. And there are then pictures of humans groping for faith as a Joyous detachment from the world without resignation. So natural forms of human expectation are lifted up and torn down. Which leads to this constant, in religious terms, revolution of expectation. The text suggests that the final power that courses in and through all things is a suffering power and is found in the despised and in the lowly, not in worldly dominion. In the vision of the coming judgment of the kingdom in Matthew 15, Jesus repeats that even as you have done unto the least of these, the suffering, the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the prisoner, so you have done unto me. Religious thinking trades in paradoxes, and the sacrificial forms of agape are one of those forms. Now, I take this analysis to be a descriptive task, simply to display the reasoning that is at, in, that is at work in these texts. In this case, they are Jewish and Christian scriptures, I think we could find very parallel kinds of processes of reflection in other texts and in courses in the phenomenology of religion that I've taught. I've had students hard at work doing that. This kind of inquiry, it seems to me, is appropriate under any academic auspices, just like we would approach the humanities and start with the description of texts, artifacts, or events, and then lay out the terms of how that humanities method comes to engage with those texts. Now, to be sure, some of what one is studying descriptively 
in the humanities, in this case religion, comes to then be appropriated in various ways by the student who becomes engaged with those texts. And so indeed, you would learn a method of inquiry that you can then apply. And in many texts, there's a powerful application. I would want to make one normative claim beyond description. And that is that it seems odd and even troubling that the power and insights of humanities texts, including religious ones, are not more consistently appropriated for critical reflection about values and human fullness within liberal education. I know that in the religious institutions here that may well take a different form, but in higher education at large, I think that that is a continuing issue with which we need to contend. Can it be that we would leave the most important questions that students would face in their lives simply to chance, simply to preference, uh, only to an advertising slogan? When we come to terms with issues about the vocation we will follow, our ab obligations to family, to our society and to our, uh, our political institutions, surely liberal education can do more and can do better. Systems of belief and value, including the narratives in which they are lodged, come with their own forms of evidence. They are different kinds of evidence than what we have to have for factual claims and for conceptual analysis. But there is evidence nonetheless. There are evil imaginations of the heart. And we know that if we are being torn apart internally or find ourselves in violent confrontations with others. We can check the criteria on which our lived narratives are based. We live now in a culture that cannot produce on its own many of the underlying beliefs and values on which we live. We need to turn our hands to the rigorous work of finding the basis of critical values and beliefs, particularly those surrounding human dignity. Now, of course, particularly in a religiously oriented institution, there are lots of other important ways in which religion takes form. There is the work of theology that has to be done every generation anew as faith can seek understanding in every new age. Then there is the important work that comes with being a community inspired by a religious mission and vision and how one can in an open way draw others to understand how the practice of religion is the essential form of his existence. So shaping a full personal identity within a community of practice is part, I would suggest, of an educational task because it has to do with human fulfillment. Let me just close by suggesting that the educational mission of Boston College as rooted in a deep and open religious identity offers an important model for higher education, not just for Catholic and Jesuit institutions. The college's evident commitment to both academic achievement and to high standards of rigor is coupled with a larger vision for higher education. It is supported by a coherent program in the undergraduate curriculum that includes both study and wider opportunities for learning and service and formation, both on the campus and off. So Boston College's educational voice should reside, should resound widely in the world of higher education. 
because it tells the story of a larger vision for liberal education. So on this anniversary, I think all of us can congratulate Boston College and salute you on the wholeness of your educational aims and achievements. We anticipate great and good things to come now and in the future. Thank you very much. Dr. Morrill, and uh, we do have time for a question and answer, so uh, you have a seat and we'll... Okay. There we go. Questions? Eric, please. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I, I think uh, as religious studies, as a religious mm -hmm. ethicist myself and someone who's embedded in the theology department here. I uh, want to thank you for, for bringing that uh, to our direct attention today in a different way than it has been so far at this conference. But um, one thing that I didn't hear is something that's perhaps not as crucial at a place like Boston College, but it, but it would be at other liberal arts institutions, and that is the distinction between the descriptive study of religion and the normative embrace of it that makes some teachers anxious. Uh, and again, we're perhaps liberated from that here at Boston College or other schools, but I wonder if you could speak to that from the uh, religious ethics side of things about how to navigate that and what the challenges and benefits are would be. I think actually uh, there are lots of ways in which even in a secular institution it's possible to do a kind of theology. Uh, and I've talk with colleagues at those places, at some places, who, who do that. It's obviously done in a different form. There is a kind of as if, and the as if, though, doesn't stop a class from working together to understand the interior forms of religious conceptuality that are going on in this text and how this is consistent with a prior text or how this claim is justified, often again, as if we were believers. I mean, we, we enter um, sympathetically into enormous varieties of texts you know, in, in all the humanities fields. And as we do that, I think it's, it's often um, possible to work within the religious tradition, uh, but you have to know how to do it, obviously, so as not to begin to go you know, entirely into um, a confessional mode of reflection. Um, so I think it's possible. I also think that as, as I look around at <coughs> curricula in religion in higher education, I mean, I do think that, you know, the fear of, I mean, the, the privatization has gone so far and because there are such different perspectives in the classroom, it's become, uh, if you will, kind of sociologically difficult to transact a lot of these ideas because uh, students often, because it's privatized, don't want to open up and talk about what it is that has prompted them to follow a certain faith path. And there is just an aura that they think a classmate who is, uh, you know, pretty hard-nosed about their, their non-believing stance is going to jump on you in some form or fashion. And I've, I've taught classes where I've found uh, it's difficult often to find just the right pitch. But I think, you know, some of the examples I was trying to give today, you know, might be one way in which to do that. I had a lot of success dealing with um, this kind of approach in a phenomenology of religion program course, and it was by saying, you know, how do these different concepts then of ultimate reality play out? And so here are theistic concepts, and let's look at those texts and see, see what kind of thinking is going on here. And I must say there were times when students really began to feel the weight of that process because they began to appropriate it and they could relate it definitely to their own lives and choice making processes. And it was still a descriptive analysis. I mean, it's not radically different in some ways than having students, you know, reading great plays, plays of Shakespeare and one student saying, well, that was a great production, but, you know, I'm really tired and let's go out and have a beer. And the other student saying, 
oh my Lord, I just got insights into my father and, that I never had until now. And boy, am I, I got to think this through because that is my father walking on the heath. So I think something of that dynamic is there, but the dominant challenge, I think, again, in secular institutions, which is the, the vast majority of places where students are educated these days, is that these questions are, th are thwarted. They, again, is there's just an intellectual culture that, that often has a hard time coming to terms with them. The open curriculum, the, um, the pattern of the disciplines often makes these difficult areas to broach. So, now I can't say, again, I think, deep down, I think there is a power to the humanities and to philosophical reflection and to religion and to poetry and literature that you can't kill. I mean, I'm sorry, it's there. I was just at, a, at a, a, an alumni weekend uh, at Brown, my alma mater, where I was asked to talk a little bit about some of the early thoughts in my talk about the value of liberal education. And there were a number of young, to me, yeah, very young graduates in their 30s and 40s who were part of this whole symposium presentation that Brown, Brown did. And there's a, if you talk about a fractured curriculum, and then if you talk about, uh, you know, a really a secular environment, yet <laughs> students were taught, one student has, you know, developed this uh, worldwide charity now protecting um, young women from, uh, who, are, who are in effect sold into slavery. I mean, just absolutely stunning horrors, and yet this really hopeful initiative. And that's based, I think, as I heard it, upon essentially um, humanistic values, uh, a person who majored in science, um, was no reference to anything that had to do with uh, a broader narrative of human life, but it was a conviction that drove that person to action. Now, I can't explain, none of us could, exactly what happened there. And there were other stories just like that. So, you know, I, I do think that, um, and for some time now, I have worried about why it is that we can't do a fuller and richer uh, job within secular education of, of finding the foundations of the very values on which uh, our lives all depend, things that we really do believe uh, about human dignity. But we, we ought to be able to uh, affirm that more unequivocally because I don't think it will sustain itself for all times unless we find and can articulate the sources on which that receives its motivation and becomes a lifelong claim I think people experience that, in fact, in ways that they articulate in, in a language that is not fully representative of what they're experiencing. Because when I hear people so committed as I did two weekends ago, it's because they have felt, I would say, an unconditioned claim. Don't, don't, you don't have to go any further than that. I mean, you can easily translate that into the experience of religion. But if you listen to their language, it's the importance that precedes all other experiences. Well, you know, religious people or philosophers start then using words like, well, it's an unconditioned experience. I think that's hopeful for finding ways to build a stronger collective foundation to which I think religion has immense amounts to contribute uh, and religion in a variety of different forms and backgrounds. So uh, religion is an important part of the humanities. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Well, then I'm going to take my chance. Uh, one of the topics that came up this morning and, and comes up often now in uh, higher education is this issue of accountability. And as I mentioned in the introduction to, to your talk, uh, the Deagle Foundation has taken the lead in sort of thinking about how to, let us say, document the, the outcomes of a liberal education. What do you see as uh, kind of hopeful trends there, given the, what is likely to be continuing pressure from accrediting institutions, the federal government, and so on, about documenting the, uh, the ineffable? When, when I was a college president, uh, like I'm sure my colleagues in the room, it, 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 sometimes the accreditors are enough to make you run screaming into the woods, because uh, often they come with uh, expectations and 
definitions of what learning is that are so cooked and predefined that you, you do want to push back very hard. But there has been a hopeful trend in development, I think, in moving toward the broad concept of learning outcomes because when one wants to think about the enduring consequences of education, that can get us into something like critical thinking which plays out in di disciplines and fields in very different ways and it can allow us then to say there are a whole range of ways in which we try to give an account of how critical thinking, let's say in a complex field like religion, is occurring. And that may mean that we have to work harder to show how in these selected courses the experiences and assignments that students and faculty are working on have these kinds of benchmark indicators and that we in fact do have these um, quote measures. They may be measures that are completely appro uh, appropriate to, to the work we're doing. Um, you can do a lot with rubrics that define the elements of the course that have these objectives around critical thinking about the finding of these assumptions about where this presupposition leads us, about how this evidence and the, and the work of the students can be assessed in those terms. And you can do a lot actually with putting that into electronic portfolios that record student work and you can ask experts from other departments to come and join in some assessment of that. You could even put some numbers on it as a way to say from course A, the introductory, to course uh, uh, D, the, the senior seminar, on these five areas of student critical thinking we've seen this evolution. Uh, is that you know, hard-nosed empirical work? No. But at the same time, there are at least indicators, uh, as they've done with something like the CLA, hardly perfect, but an example of people trying to push on the, on the learning outcome side. And I think that uh, as long as we don't get prescriptive and as long as we say there's only, there's, there are lots more than one ways to do it and keep the pluralism of approaches, I think we can benefit from that concern for accountability. Focusing on the improvement elements, uh, the, the accountability elements are going to be hard to satisfy if people want to use things like starting salaries as the, as the definition of what the education was worth. That simply is a confusion of languages. I mean, people in the marketing world have languages about value. Fine. I understand those and I sometimes use them. But that's not the same as the, the intrinsic value that we're talking about. We can have conversations, we can have good exchanges about those things, but we know how to order the thoughts and sometimes in the languages of marketing there is only one standard and it's a monetary standard. And other times in government there are other ways of thinking. And I understand that, there have to be. There's a certain accountability pattern there that is the way government works. But we, don't we, can, we can say, I understand and appreciate that and we can give you this, but that doesn't go to the question of the fundamental value of the enterprise because here are the things that we're doing that, speak, that, that are beyond what you know, we can measure in the ways you want. Now, if people harden their positions, as sometimes happens politically, then of course you get into another problem. And, but I think higher education has made great strides in simply saying, okay, we want to improve ourselves, there are ways we can be more systematic about that accountability process, particularly around improvement, and we want to do that. Thank you. Uh, one question. Yes. Please. Uh, there's a microphone coming. Hello, I'm Brian Murdoch. I'm a city priest, and I have a question for Dr. Morell regarding an imaginative exercise that if you were to go on a great retreat, who would your, and, and you would get to bring the top 10 moral leaders in the world, who would your top 10 be? Right now? Yeah. Uh, obviously Nelson Mandela would have to be probably near the top of that list. Um, I'd have to try to find a Republican. I don't know if I could, though. <laughs> um, um, I, I have to interrupt. You know, uh, you were quoting the Old Testament earlier. 
right. and you know that Abraham was bargaining with God for Sodom and Gomorrah, and it, God said there had to be 50, and then he, Abraham bargained him down to 10. Could we bargain you down to three? No, <laughs> <laughs> go for 10. <laughs> It's going to be hard. Well, let's see. We lost Mother Teresa, but I mean, I might have to struggle to put her on the list. We have a program at the University of Richmond which is on the study of leadership. Uh, it's an undergraduate, actually, it's a major. And in that program, we have um, a very peculiar definition of leadership because it's rooted around uh, the ideas of service and, uh, if you will, ethical influence. So, I mean, I think if you look in, uh, more and uh, give me a little bit of a span beyond currently people currently living, you'd have to have um, uh, Martin Luther King. You'd have to have Pope John Paul XXIII. Um, so those would be, I think, well you, I mean, if you go way back in history, um, there is something extraordinarily um, ethereal, even, about um, Abraham Lincoln. The, the, if you read Lincoln's second inaugural, I, I think there's something so transcendent and powerful that it's, uh, even though he was not, I think, highly, quote, conventionally religious. So I would turn to Mahatma Gandhi. I mean, Gandhi, King, um, Mandela, the, uh, the Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama, yeah, that's a very, he's, um, there's a transcendent element there that is very powerful. Well, I think we're going to have to call this to a close, and, uh, and the struggle that you're facing is perhaps indicative of the need for a liberal education for all of our new people. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.